Ah, uh, memories. Oh hey, welcome back to the Deep Discog Dive. I'm just looking back on some old family vacation photos of me and the National, who are my dads and my best friends. This is us at Disney World. This is us in New Zealand. And this is a shot I took when we got carried to Ohio in a swarm of bees. Why spend a few hours flying to Ohio when you could spend multiple days to get there and get covered in bee stings? Today, we're talking about the National. Let's dive in. Come on, Laura. We begin at the University of Cincinnati in 1991. Five dudes attending the school's graphic design program started a band called Nancy. Now, everyone knows this band for kickstarting the career of Casey Rays, the co-creator of the processing programming language. But two of the other bandmates were Scott Devendorf and Matt Berninger. Also, let's nip that in the bud right now. That's how you pronounce his last name. I'm Matt Berninger from The National. I've been saying Berninger. You have? That's wrong. <laughs> it's Berninger. I also thought it was Absolutely. Berninger for years. This is like my own personal Bernstein Bears, or in this case, Bernstein Bears. Anyway, Nancy was together for five years. They only released one album, Ruther 3429. It's very ramshackle in production, but a good time, especially if you like bands like Pavement. You can find it easily on YouTube. Nancy broke up when Matt and Scott moved to Brooklyn around 1998. Scott's brother Brian also moved to Brooklyn, and through the Devendorfs, Matt met two of their childhood friends who had also just moved to Brooklyn, twin brothers Aaron and Bryce Desner. Together, the two Devendorfs, the one Berninger, and Aaron, but not Bryce, started a new band in 1999, The National. The next few years saw The National holding down day jobs while playing shows at New York City venues like Luna Lounge. And keep in mind, this is the early 2000s we're talking about. The National were playing the same venues where acts like The Strokes and Yeah Yeah Yeahs cut their teeth. In fact, for a time, the band's rehearsal space was right next to Interpol's. Interpol, if Lana Del Rey wrote songs about New York City and was also multiple dudes. Aaron and Bryce started their own label in 2001, Brassland Records. And for the label's first release, The National made their self-titled debut in October 2001. One of my favorite parts of doing this series is looking at records with certain narratives or preconceptions and exploring them for myself. Sometimes I agree with the narrative, sometimes I discover something else. The main narrative you'll see surrounding the Nationals' self-titled debut is that it has a country sound, at least compared to the records that they would go on to make. The country is there, you know, you listen to the perfect song, American Mary, Pay For Me, the slide guitar on Watching You Well, and you think, wow, are these guys gonna open for the Wallflower soon? You might also ask if there's a place to listen to those songs and all the other ones I mentioned in this video. Yeah. But there's more to explain here. The National is less a national album and more a suggestion towards what a national album could be. Look at it piecemeal. Brian's drumming is there, but it's distant and abstract. Aaron's rocking both guitar and bass, but his parts are subtler and more about texture. Matt's got that signature baritone already, but his melodies are less defined in their motion. And his lyrics conjure depictions of self-doubt, depression, and broken relationships, but the delivery rambles. All of these descriptors might make it seem like this record is weak, but I think it's more interesting to define the national as part of the overall puzzle, as part of the artistic growth these guys will go through over the course of the next two decades or so. That's another thing I love about doing this series, viewing the totality of a career, what aspects of a band and sound live on and what aspects are dumped after one record. And through that lens, it's interesting to hear these songs as experiments. I don't think the National of today could get away with a song like 29 Years, this lo-fi fragmentary passage. You know, I dreamed about you for 29 years before I saw you. Is fragmentary passage an actual phrase? Hold on, let me look this up. Oh god, it's a Kingdom Hearts subtitle. So yes, the National self-titled is singular, and other records will end up defining the band more, but that means this one gets to stand on its own as this funky little thing. I think that's neat. 
The National self-titled was definitely perceived in late 2001. Finding any press or reviews at the time of its release was tricky, but what reviews they got were solid. The band was frequently compared to the likes of Nick Cave, Leonard Cohen, and Silver Jews. In the fall of 2002, they started playing shows in Europe, and now's as good a time as any to talk about that band name. In a 2007 interview, Matt said that it's supposed to be a nothing name. Like, you go down the street and you see things called the National This or the National That. That's all well and good in the US, but over in Europe, the word national can be interpreted differently. Specifically in Germany, where they once had some very notable nationalists. And so, according to Matt, the band had to do press where they said, guys, look, we're not nationalists, we're just from Ohio. Other exact details about what happened between the band's first two records are hazy, but the biggest development is our boy Bryce became an official member of the band. A bunch of brothers standing around, yes! Sad Songs for Dirty Lovers, released in September 2003. That title could apply to any national album. Production duties were handled by the band and Nick Lloyd, as they were on the self-titled record, but we've also got Peter Cadis and Paul Heck behind the board as well. At this point in time, Peter was most well known for producing Interpol's Turn on the Bright Lights, and you might know Mr. Heck as a co-producer of the 1993 AIDS charity compilation album, No Alternative. If The National's first album was a suggestion as to what they could be, Sad Songs is a definitive statement. This really is patient zero for The National. First Ohio, then the world. The country influence does peak up in places like 90 Mile Waterwall, but there's a newfound tightness and weight to these songs, not dissimilar to the songs on Interpol's star-making record. It Never Happened also starts out with a country feel, and then staples on an extended two-minute jam outro. New sonic flourishes appear often, like the strings on Thirsty, or the electronic drums on Sugar Wife. Plus, the band is so kind, they give you multiple wives. We also have the prototypes of those classic national bangers. Murder Me Rachel, Available, Slipping Husband, The Best Yu-Gi-Oh card. On those last two, Matt does a good bit of yelling. Which you don't hear much on their later records. You'll definitely hear it live though, even to this day. Sad Songs for Dirty Lovers is good. I remember not caring for it much when I first listened many years ago. I don't know why I held that opinion. What the hell is wrong with me? Sad Songs for Dirty Lovers got way more attention than the band's self-titled. Relatively. But small progress is still progress. The next year and a half saw the band play even more shows around the world. July 2004 saw the release of Cherry Tree, which is either an EP or a mini album, depending on whether Puxatani Phil sees his shadow. The band said these were songs from the sessions for their third album that had a different character. And there's three I'd like to highlight. First, there's All the Wine. Gotta say, The National were flooring it from zero to wistful sorrow faster and faster with each new song. Just listen to those intertwined guitars at the start. I wonder what sordid tale Matt is about to tell us. I'm a perfect piece of ass, like every Californian. Yes, yes, yes. Thank you, Matt. Second is the title track, which is a good song with an excellent build. Why is this song not playing every time I go to Ace Hardware? And third, we've got about today. I love it when artists just make songs that wholly capture their ethos and the emotions you get when you listen. The National may only have two emotions, careful fear and dead devotion, but About Today is where they get the balance right. It's one of the most depressing songs in their catalog, about a relationship that's failing but neither person in it can or wants to fix it. That guitar line Aaron plays is simple and beautiful. And yet here's the thing, this is probably my least favorite version of it. That's not because of what this version is or isn't, but rather because of what this song will become through various live performances. If I were a smart person, I'd say this song's development over time is a mirroring of the band's own growth over time. Unfortunately, I'm a dumb person, so someone else is gonna have to carry that torch across the finish line. Cherry Tree was where the national momentum kicked into a new gear. It got them more fans, some shows opening for the Walkman, and a deal signed with Beggar's Banquet. 
everything was pointing to their next record being a big deal. But sadly, before they could finish it, they were all eaten by an alligator released in April 2005. Apparently when this album first came out, a lot of people thought it was their debut. You ever say something that is literally incorrect, but figuratively correct? Like your facts are wrong, but your vibe is right? Every new record from the band from here on out will feature the same core formula, but with some tweaks. Maybe it's new instrumentation. Maybe it's experiments with composition and structure. Maybe it's guest musicians. If the band's core formula doesn't click for you, then this could be an obstacle for you to get into their music. For me though, that core formula is what I like to call good. And on Alligator, the formula has seen solid refinement from sad songs. It's in the details, you know? The strings and slurred vocals on Val Jester, the mini orchestra on the Geese of Beverly Road, the propulsive finger-picked guitar on Looking for Astronauts. Each song has at least one piece to it that will perk your ear up. Certainly helps too that Matt was starting to get real good at melodies. I find it so hard to not sing along to the chorus of Lit Up. Lit up. yelling on Abel. And of course that closer, Mr. November. The song is about a politician and was inspired by John Kerry's presidential campaign, the first instance of the national injecting political undertones into their music. Would it be weird to call Alligator a delightful album? I know it isn't, but I just enjoy hearing the band step into themselves like this. A shame about the Alligator incident though. Alligator gave the band great reviews, multiple best of the year placements, and some solid slots playing big festivals. I wish I could say there were big developments between records, but not really. They played more shows around the world and then they recorded the next record. In the clearing stands Boxer. In May 2007, here's a fun fact. That cover is the band performing Geese of Beverly Road at Peter Cadis's wedding reception. Picture this, Alligator, but more! Boxer continues the winning streak from Alligator by just winning super hard and also all over everything. This marks the first time the band's songwriting credits were attributed to specific members instead of just The National. The songs on here are primarily written by Matt and Aaron, with Bryce and Scott occasionally joining in. There are also songwriting credits for Corinne Besser, a past fiction editor for The New Yorker, and Matt's wife. Now we could talk about how Fake Empire is the best album opener The National have made thus far, how it expands the band's standard melancholy by taking slight aim at the overarching societal system, but instead I want to talk about this. Take a listen to this clip. Now that piano is rocking a polyrhythm. One hand's playing in four, the other in three. If you're like me, you heard that clip in four. Plus, Matt's melody emphasizes four beats. Put a little something in a lemonade. But after the second chorus, this happens. Joke's on you, bucko. This song's actually been in three. If that's intentional, if that's real, then that's a wonderful way of musically showing what the lyrics tell us. And indeed, that lyrical framing, same melancholy, bigger target, carries into many of the other songs. Mistaken for Strangers is not only a sonic banger, but a lyrical one too. Like, listen to this. The first time I heard Squalor Victoria, it was at a concert where they also played Mr. November. Turns out in a live setting, those songs can be really similar, but their studio versions are pretty different. Slow Show is really sweet. I wanna hurry home to you. Put on a slow, dumb show for you. Crack you up. Me and who am I right? Oh, OK. 
Okay, I see what you're doing there. It's neat too, because most of Slow Show is in E major, then it changes to B major for that 29 years interpolation, and that leads nicely into Apartment Story, which is also in B major. I love tonal consistency between album tracks. Let's go! And speaking of Apartment Story, this is that good stuff. You know that good stuff? This is it. One of my favorite national tracks to this day. And don't forget its great music video, where this anonymous woman in red heels inspires a bunch of 30-somethings to get up and boogie. That's uplifting. Racing Like a Pro and Ada both air on the somber side, and both also feature mid-2000s indie boy wonder Sufjan Stevens. Bryce Desner had been working with him the past few years, and we will definitely see Subaru on more national songs. What a lovely thing to see, the national punching above their weight class and scoring a real knockout. Boxer continued the linear growth that the National Corporation had experienced over the past few fiscal years. This marks the point where notable public things related to the band started happening. For instance, Fake Empire was used during Barack Obama's 2008 presidential campaign. Interesting choice. In May 2008, the band released their first documentary, A Skin, A Night. It's been on YouTube for a while now, and I'd recommend it. I also recommend the EP that released at the same time, the Virginia EP. Its crowning moment is a great live recording of About Today, which had become far more fleshed out compared to its cherry tree version. <laughs> In February 2009, there was Dark Was the Night, a compilation album produced by the Desners with money going to the Red Hot Organization for AIDS and HIV awareness. My god, look at that track list! This is a glorified mid to late 2000s indie rock hall of fame. The National contributed a song called So Far Around the Bend. Imagine if Sufjan Stevens' Circa Illinois produced a national song and you're close to what this sounds like. Worth a listen. Aaron also did a song with Justin Vernon, aka Bon Iver, called Big Red Machine. Cool song title, though in my opinion, it would have been an even cooler band name. The National also provided tracks to two other compilations. They covered Crooked Fingers' Sleep All Summer with St. Vincent for a Merge Records 20th anniversary album, and a cover of Polaris's Ashamed of the Story I Told for a Mark Mulcahy tribute album. Their fifth album, High Violet, released in May, 2010. Can I just say, truly great album cover. The messy drawings collectively moving down and to the right, the bold font in the left-hand corner, the consistent use of purple, hot. I wish I had more of an explanation for why this album turned out to be what it was. Like, am I supposed to just say that High Violet catapulted the band to new levels of stardom and set the stage for all their future successes, and all the band did was be cool dudes who rock? What the hell? All of that is funny because, like many, this was my first taste of The National. 15-year-old Mike found it through Stereo Gum, put on the opener Terrible Love, and did not get it. At all. The song clearly builds to this stunning crescendo, but at the time, I thought the whole mix sounded so... distant? It wasn't until I saw them play it live that I realized what a cannonball this track was. And also the alternate version on High Violet's Expanded Edition. Now that I'm remembering it, the first couple tracks didn't really click for me at the time. The main thing I think of when it comes to Sorrow is the art installation where they played it 105 times in a row. Why though? Anyone's Ghost is where my lukewarm opinion started to heat up, and Afraid of Everyone is where the album enters sicko status. I swear that Sufjan Stevens is humming right at the start. But then I looked at the liner notes and he's not there? But when they played this song on Letterman, he was there? Am I going crazy? Blood Buzz Ohio is not only one of the best songs of the Nationals career, but it's the one that turned me into one of the band's children and also best friends. It is simply outstanding. And you can make all the jokes you want. You're telling me a blood buzz this Ohio? But this is a microcosm, a thesis statement of what the National do best, melancholic triumph. Listen to this damn chorus. I was carried. To Ohio in a swamp of 
According to an AMA, the swarm that carried Matt was just 11 bees. What are they giving the bees in Ohio these days? Also, according to Matt, a lemon world is an invented, sexy, weird place where you can escape from New York. I thought that was just upstate New York. Conversation 16 was another track that sold me on the national. I always get a kick out of that chorus. I was a friend. Yet another example to show that the National are funny, comma, actually. Also, its music video is great. Helps when you get actors from two of my favorite shows at the time. I love the use of horns on England. They're not forward-facing like fake Empire, but rather they accent the escalating dynamic stages the song moves between. I also love those higher harmonies on the outro. They feel so good. The first time I heard Vanderlyle Crybaby Blues, it was their closer during a live show. And I believe I heard it in its natural habitat. This thing is as perfect a setlist closer as you can get. I'll explain everything to the keys. Yeah, man. It's like, great. High Violet is simply the national being the national some more, and it just so happens to be one of the finest albums of its time. High Violet wasn't just a good record, it was a big deal. Sure, it got great reviews like national albums always did, but the band's profile as a whole had risen more than ever before. Bigger venues, higher festival placements, late night TV appearances. The national had become a national phenomenon. And you know what that means. Tie-in songs for movies and TV shows. In April 2011, they provided the song Think You Can Wait for Win Win starring Paul Giamatti. Paul Giamatti, the national of actors. A mere six days after that, the band said, screw it, we're gamers. Exile Vilify for the game Portal 2. Without spoiling it, you'd have to go out of your way to hear the song in game, which is a shame because this is one of my favorite national songs from this time period. Why is it not on streaming services though? I blame Wheatley for this. Later in September, two of their songs appeared in the film Warrior. One of them is a studio recording of the long version of About Today. What? Hey, I just made the cure for cancer. I'm gonna go put it in a highlights magazine. Again, I won't spoil the context for when the song gets played, but uh, it's real good. It's a genuine shame that this version of the song is also just not on streaming services. What's up with that? The tie-in songs continued into 2012. There was The Reigns of Castamere for the second season of Game of Thrones, and I'll See You in My Dreams for Boardwalk Empire. Both of those shows are very serious and in line with the tone of many national songs. So naturally, the third tie-in song they did this year was for Bob's Burgers. Oh, and when it comes to individual bandmates, Aaron Desner produced Sharon Van Etten's album Tramp. This marks the beginning of Aaron's solo producing career outside of the national, making, as Taylor Swift put it this year, indie records that were much cooler than hers. Imagine if they made a record together, that would be wild. The national's next album was announced in February, 2013. And that same month, we also got their second documentary, Mistaken for Strangers. Instead of a stereotypical band doc, this time it's more of an exploration of brotherhood. The film stars and was directed by Tom Berninger, Matt's brother. You ever been in a room with a bunch of brothers? No, you haven't. You're alive. In May 2013, The National released Trouble Will Find Me. Trouble Will Find Me is the best national album ever made. And while that's not actually true, you'll believe it when you're listening, which makes it real in the moment, if nothing else. I spoke earlier about the preconceptions we associate with bands, and for better or worse, Trouble embodies the national's stereotypes more fully than any other album. It is the most national, national album so far. This was the first time that production on a national album was specifically attributed to the Desner brothers and not the band as a whole. Aaron said this was the first record the band really enjoyed making. And as a listener, it feels like the band knows who they are now where they stand, the kind of venues they'll be playing from here on out. I mean, look at that track list, jeez. One day when we get the National's Greatest Hits album, like half of it is gonna come from here. Demons was the first single, and I think it's a pretty underrated track in the grand scheme of things. Reminds me of the haziness that turned me off Terrible Love, but I like it here. Don't Swallow the Cap is now a staple of the band's live shows. It tickles me so. Lots of good moments, but my favorite is this one bit where a voice whispers, 
beautiful loving thing you know for me. Only happens once. Nice detail. Sea of Love is excellent, and I believe the first time the band has busted out the harmonica. Its music video is based on a vid from band Sfuki Mew. Not only are the Nationals' song and video great, but that Sfuki Mew track slaps too. The album as a whole is paced really well, alternating between the faster and slower songs with great intuition. Some of the other highlights include Fireproof, Graceless, Pink Rabbits, and This Is The Last Time. But my favorite? I Need My Girl is another all-timer in the Nationals catalog. It's the definition of tasteful, the melody, the lyrics, the production, the echoes of the guitar part coming in after the second chorus. Love it. I know I'm repeating myself, but once again, the Nationals succeed by being themselves. Imagine being yourself. No thanks. Trouble Will Find Me found the National maintaining their new place in the musical pecking order. They also played on a 2014 SNL episode hosted by Lena Dunham. What a wonderfully early 2010 sentence. The tour for Trouble kicked off in fall 2013 at Boston Calling, a festival co-curated by Aaron. I got to see them the following year at Boston Calling, and they were excellent. I also saw my favorite band, Spoon, at that festival. I stood at the barricade for 11 hours straight with no food or water to see them front row. And when I met up with my friends afterwards, they got me a tasty burger and a bottle of Sprite. And when I sat down to eat and drink, the euphoria I experienced was comparable to a man finding nourishment after wandering many days in the harsh Sahara Desert. Anyway, the same year I saw God was also the same year that The National started working on a new album. This time, there are actual changes to their process that I can report. Matt spoke on how they wanted to develop the songs in a live setting before recording. Plus, thanks to the 2016 single Prom Song 13th Century Frankie and Johnny with St. Vincent, The National were bringing in more electronic and synthetic influences. Wait, sorry, I'm skipping ahead a bit. There are two things from 2015 worth highlighting. First, Matt formed a new band with Brent Knopf, Elvi. They've only released one album as of now, Return to the Moon, and it is a great time. You know that copy pasta that's like, quirked up white boy with a little bit of swag, busts it down sexual style, is he goaded with the sauce? That plus the national equals Return to the Moon. Paul is alive. It's a little bit more sonically adventurous than the national, and at times, really damn funny. I'll be the one in the lobby in a colored me shirt. The second 2015 event was the band setting up their own studio, Long Pond Recording Studio, in Hudson Valley, New York. This is significant because this is where the bulk of any future national albums and records produced by Aaron will be recorded, but also because it's fairly close to where I grew up. There's a non-zero percent likelihood that the national have been to a Stewart's, and that makes me very happy. Long Pond happens to star on the cover of Sleep Well Beast released in September 2017. There's an old Virgil Abloh quote about how you only need to tweak something by 3% in order to innovate, and I'm reminded of it when I think about Sleep Well Beast. If I were to describe this album to you, you might think it's the same as the past few national albums, and yet I'm going to tell you multiple times that this is their best album, and this time I'm not lying. Here's the first time. This is their best album. On the lyrical end, this one is not just about relationships, it's primarily about marriages. In fact, all of the lyrics this time are credited to both Matt and Corinne Besser. And on the musical end, not only is that song with St. Vincent on here as Dark Side of the Gym, but it was a harbinger of things to come. A horseman of the national using subtle electronic textures. Beyond that, this is another national album. And it's their best one. Let's talk this lead single, The System Only Dreams in Total Darkness. Incredible, one of the best national songs ever. Such a unique rhythm compared to most other national songs. The sharp guitar stabs that punctuate throughout. Those close vocal harmonies on the intro and first chorus. The system only dreams in total darkness. Why are you hiding? Matt yelling after the choruses. Matt cannot explain the And that solo Aaron gets to bust out. The part where he's just alternating between two chords is one of my favorite moments in any song, national or otherwise.
It's not technically complicated, but the sound Aaron gets, that harsh distortion, sounds so good. I also like how, in live performances, they get horns in on the action. Good touch. You've also got Day I Die with its referencing of the greater national musical universe. I'll Still Destroy You, which has some of the sickest drum production. barn burner that is Turtleneck, which contains the most overt political referencing on the whole album. I mentioned before how this record is primarily about marriages, but the cloud of politics hangs over this album more intensely than any national record since Boxer. Matt spoke about how Beast isn't meant to be more political than any other national album, but many of the songs feel... 2017 coded, if you know what I mean? For heck's sake, Walk It Back has a pitch-shifted spoken word passage that quotes a Carl Rove interview. People like you are still living what we call the reality-based community. You believe that solutions emerge from your judicious study of discernible reality. That's not the way the world really works anymore. When the album slows down, it's also good, because this is their best album. Guilty Party is gorgeously atmospheric. Piano ballad Corinne at the Liquor Store has this lyric that I always miss here. I'm walking around like I was the one who found dead John Cheever. Now, I had two questions when I heard this. One, why is Don Cheadle dead? Two, what would you look like if you were the one who found dead Don Cheadle? Sorry, I'm late, guys. I was just thinking about how much I loved Hotel Rwanda. And Dark Side of the Gym, which I mentioned before, is a lovely waltz. I have dreams of Also, a bunch of these music videos were directed by Casey Rays, their old Nancy bandmate. Look at that. I love this album dearly. It is, in my opinion, pound for pound, the best national album yet conceived. Say it with me now. An album by The National was well received by the general public. More great reviews, more touring, and the band won their first Grammy Award. I almost forgot to mention, earlier in 2017, Bryce was a featured composer on Planetarium, a song cycle about the solar system done by him, Nico Muley, James McAllister, and Sufjan Stevens. I actually love this record and would like to discuss it more at some point, maybe when Suff Jam gets his own deep discog dive. In 2018, the Desner brothers scored the stage musical Cyrano, starring Peter Dinklage. Matt and Corinne also contributed lyrics for a couple songs, and the band were featured on the soundtrack album with the song Somebody Desperate. Aaron Desner also teamed up with Justin Vernon in 2018 to form Big Red Machine, with an album of the same name getting released. It's a damn good blend of the electronic flourishes from Sleep Well Beast and the sound Bon Iver was going for on 22 a Million and would go on to do for I.I. I highly recommend it if you enjoy either artist. One might think that, with the success of Beast and the bandmates' outside projects, that a new national album would be put on the back burner. Turns out, one is a fool. A dumbass, even. A new national album was announced in March 2019 and released just two months later. I am easy to find. This might feel weird to say this far into this retrospective, but I Am Easy to Find is the national record I'm most excited to talk about because I still don't fully get what I'm holding here. This is possibly the most musically obtuse thing the band has made yet. First off, there are so many women! Matt said it was to have a fabric of people's voices, and joked that his own ego made it so that there weren't any other male singers. The lyrics aren't necessarily different from any other national album, but the mere presence of women singing some of these lines brings a new perspective, or at least an invitation to consider a new perspective. You Had Your Soul With You and Hairpin Turns both feature Gail Ann Dorsey, David Bowie's bassist for most of his later records. The title track features Kate stables from This Is The Kit. You never were much of a New Yorker. It wasn't in your eyes. 
Yeah, you were always more of a Boise person. Not to mention, Matt sometimes delivers lyrics in a more off-the-cuff, spoken word style, like on The Pull of You or Not in Kansas. I'm either at the bottom of a well or spinning into somebody's outdoor glass furniture. Is this how I lose it? Everything at once carried to space by a dolphin balloon? And like the lyrics, the music isn't substantially different from Sleep Well Beast, but the band managed to pull off these abstract turns, like Dust Swirls in Strange Lights or Her Father in the Pool. If there's a crown jewel for me personally, it's So Far, So Fast. For one thing, it's less a national song and more a Lisa Hannigan song produced by The National. I was just coming out of it. Second, it's hard to explain without just playing the entire back half of the song, but it grows without building in this very hypnotizing way. It naturally expands like a belly when you're taking a deep breath or primordial ooze when you're doing stuff with primordial ooze. Hey, Rylan finally got a studio version. I haven't mentioned this yet, but starting around the tour for High Violet, they started playing a song called Rylan. It had become a fan favorite, yet it had not gotten an official release until now. And this version is great. And finally, Light Years, one of the band's finest ballads. Everybody has a superpower, and mine is being able to identify that piano in any recording. From you. Its timbre is burned, seared, pan-fried into my mind. I should also mention the band's collaboration with director Mike Mills. Not only is he a credited writer on two tracks, but he also directed a short film influenced by the album. Though a press release mentions that the album and the film are not directly linked. Like, the album is not explicitly the soundtrack for the film. Oh, to live life at all ages as Alicia Vikander. The film is a nice time, not just for the experience of watching it, but for the slightly different song mixes they use throughout. It's available on YouTube. I've said many things about this album, most of them good, but I should also make clear that this is not the first national record you should check out. I don't think it's a difficult listen by any means, but it's the one that makes you work the most. In many ways, this redefines what a national album can be. It's like you're painting for fun on a canvas with straight orderly lines, and then you just throw on a big old glob of paint. Sure, it looks messy, takes up more space, but it opens up new possibilities of what the painting could be. It was easy to find solid reviews for The National's eighth album, and another tour went until December 2019. The band's 2020 was pretty quiet. I can only wonder why. But the bandmates were still in the news. Matt released his first solo album, Serpentine Prison, and Aaron... <laughs> What's wild about this is that this happened almost four years ago, and I'm very aware that it happened. And yet every time I think about it, there's a part of me that gets surprised. Uh, imagine if you got surprised every time you ate cereal. What's even more wild is that folklore is really damn good. So good that we got a sister album later in 2020 that was also produced by Aaron. And oh, oh lord, is that a Taylor Swift song with featuring the national? In the title, Be Still My Beating Heart. Aaron would continue working with Taylor on some of the bonus tracks for her Taylor's version re-recordings. In 2021, Cyrano got adapted into a movie. Aaron and Bryce composed some additional pieces for it. Like in 2018, Aaron balanced scoring for Cyrano with a Big Red Machine album. How long do you think it's gonna last? Another good record with a lot of guest stars, like Robin Pecknold, Anais Mitchell, and Taylor Swift. The National started touring again in 2022. I saw them again during this tour when they played Primavera Sound. They played two new songs there, which I honestly don't remember much of, probably because I was fighting for my life in a swarm of drunk Europeans to get one, parentheses, one single drink. Primavera is built different, you guys. The general public did not have to wait long for new recorded music, though. In August 2022, the band put out Weird Goodbyes with Bon Iver, though it did not end up being on their next album. That next album was First Two Pages of Frankenstein in April 2023. Hi, I'm Paul. Now, two major narratives come into play for this record. The first is that it apparently saved the band. Matt said in an interview that every record of theirs saves the band, but Frankenstein is the one that, quote, really came to the rescue. Speaking of Matt, the second bit of context is that he was dealing with writer's block and severe depression, and this album was a major help in getting out of that particular funk. I am very glad that Matt was able to process those emotions through the making of this record and come out in a healthier place. But now we enter 
a weird space, a weird thing to reckon with. What happens when you make something that helps you process your depression and it helps your band stay together and the public decides it's your least good record yet. There are still good songs, of course. Tropic Morning News is credited by Aaron as the song that kickstarted the band's creative process for this record. I like it a good deal. Great melody from Matt that keeps a bit of the rambling energy from easy to find. I was suffering more than I did on the Tropic Morning News was on. Sufjan's back on Once Upon a Poolside, Your Mind Is Not Your Friend, has Matt duetting with Phoebe Bridgers over, again, the light years piano. The Alcott sees Taylor Swift returning the feature favor. What's weirder, a Taylor Swift song featuring the National or a National song featuring Taylor Swift? Both take me to the hidden place. New Order t-shirt and Grease in Your Hair are also highlights. Let me reiterate, these are good songs. But as I describe them, I begin to realize that Frankenstein doesn't have as many bangers or explosive moments as past albums. In fact, I find myself asking the same thing I ask when I'm watching any of 32 specific episodes of Family Guy. Where's Brian? Like, where's Brian's drumming? Without him, this is just a bunch of quiet music for sad dads. Come on, I wanna listen to some loud music for sad dads. For example, let's revisit Tropic Morning News. Again, I like that song, but when it comes time for Aaron's solo on the bridge, there's a key change that feels... ...like nothing. It feels like... Okay, ladies and gentlemen, we are now approaching the key change section of the song. Well, wasn't that incredible? Thank you for choosing American Mary Tours Gift Shop is on the left. To confirm my suspicions, I went and listened to all of these songs live where Brian is there drumming. And yeah, he's the missing piece. These songs come alive when he's there. For real, if he was more present on the record, I don't think Frankenstein would have gotten such a mixed reception. I, of course, cannot speak for any of the members of the National, but maybe, after a paint splatter like I Am Easy to Find and the various developments that followed, including one of your members producing an album for the biggest pop star on the planet, they needed to figure out what a National album even was in 2023. In that sense, Frankenstein reminds me of the National's first record. And while that may come off like a damnation of Frankenstein, I don't mean it as one. Artistic growth is a fickle thing, and progress doesn't always mean moving forward in a linear fashion. It's a national album. It's still good. First two pages of Frankenstein received an okay reception. Back when it released, Aaron commented on the lack of weird goodbyes and said that song didn't feel at home on that record. But he did hint that it would find another home. Boy, that was quick. All right, so the National think they're hotshots, huh? They think they're Beyonce? They're big enough to do surprise releases? They announced another album three days before it released, Laugh Track, in September 2023. As you might imagine, given the fact that the break between albums was as long as one-tenth of the Civil War, the sound of Laugh Track isn't too different from Frankenstein. But here's the biggest change, Brian's back in full force. That's no accident, by the way. The band directly said one of the aims of Laugh Track was to give Brian more playing time. And man, does he get time. Tracks like Space Invader and Deep End, Pauls and Pieces are given tremendous corpuscles of life thanks to the drums. Phoebe Bridgers pops up again on the title track, and I gotta say, this is the strangest episode of Bob's Burgers I've ever seen. Weird Goodbyes gets its home finally, and while I did like it at first, I find myself liking it more in context with the rest of the album. But there's a track on here that's so interesting that I'm interested in it. Smoke Detector is the album closer. It was recorded on the spot, a jam session during a sound check in Vancouver, and it's fascinating. Remember how I pointed out the spoken word delivery Matt adopted on I Am Easy to Find? It comes back in full force here. And hearing the rest of the band move around Matt, find chances to stand out or blend back in, it's invigorating. And I do wonder if its spirit will reveal itself on any future national albums. Thank God I get to end this dive by doing what I do best, saying the national are good. Thanksgiving's all about. 
We're less than six months out from Laugh Track's release, so naturally there isn't much to report about the band. They're still touring for Frankenstein and Laugh Track, and I imagine Aaron will be present in some capacity on the future Taylor's version releases. Maybe he'll also be on the Tortured Poets Department? That name could also work for any national album. If you want to get into the national, most people would probably say that the best entry point is High Violet, but I would personally suggest either Boxer or Trouble Will Find Me. And then of course there is my personal favorite, Sleep Well Beast. Basically check out these records. And if you liked this retrospective and you want to hear more about bands and their backgrounds and the albums that they've made, check out my deep disc dive on Coldplay.